actually an email from Jonathan and he said, hey, I used to looking for a job in uh, residency in the US, so what are you doing? And I said, yeah, I'm still looking, but I'm in England still working. And um, he said, well, one of the interns, this was on a Friday, so one of the interns is gonna get fired on Monday. Uh, they're gonna look for somebody. Um, so send me your CV. And I was like, um, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I sent him my CV, didn't know what would happen from that. I had never met Jonathan before. I just spoke into him on the phone um, and sent him a couple of emails. Um, and lo and behold, yes, that intern got fired. And it wasn't because, you know, I made I did juju or anything like that. <laughs> but it was just purely, um, he was involved in what in the US is called sexual harassment. And so he got fired uh, because he made an approach to one of the secretaries at work and uh, the secretary didn't like it and he, he lost his job because of that. Um, I got invited to come for an interview and I came for an interview, um, got us, um, they interviewed a couple other people and then, in, then they gave me the spot. Um, but it was a preliminary spot, which means that I still didn't know whether I'll have surgery the following year. Um, so I did the prelim for one year, um, and whilst I was looking for other general surgery jobs. And then the second year, um, I did prelim again at the same place. And I um, actually had a few of my friends, um, who my Ghanaian friends who were here doing residency in medicine, they called me to have an intervention with me, telling me that I should stop doing the, um, <clears throat> stop chasing my surgery dream because I had done two years prelim if I was doing internal medicine, which I had the grades at the time to be able to do, I would have done two years and have only one year left. But here I was still without a, um, a permanent spot. Um, but luckily for me and, and unfortunately for them, um, just the week that they called me, um, just a few days before, in fact, I had been offered a categorical spot. Um, and that was just from working really, really hard and being dedicated. Um, they had six, um, 80 hour work rule, but probably working over 120 hours um, and just being dedicated. And I was able to get a surgery job. So um, that's how I ended up doing um, general surgery um, in the US. So I never matched for all of you who, you know, people try to match and try to get into it. Um, I held on to my dream and luckily I was able to um, get to do what I always wanted to do. Um, somehow I always ended up in the GI floor, colorectal floor, um, and kind of that, that has been my path. So after working as a general surgeon for some years, um, I decided that in fact, I was happy doing general surgery, but there was robotic surgery was a thing, uh, had become a thing after my training. And I felt that I was, um, uh, being left, well, I wouldn't say being left behind, but I really wanted to know how to use the robot because I had been to by the hospital where I trained and I thought third year residents being very facile with the robots and using it. And I felt that in a couple of years, they'll come out and they'll be competing with me. And it just looked so cool using the robots. And I, at the age of 45, decided to go and do a fellowship in colorectal and robotics and eventually do the colorectal that I've always wanted to do. Um, so I went in and applied for fellowship and I became a very old fellow, uh, because I was 45 years old doing the fellowship and my co-fellow was a young Nigerian lady was 29. And, uh, I was actually older than all the attendings apart from one. Um, but I was there to learn and he did teach me, um, and today, um, I've been doing colorectal surgery with um, robotics um, for uh, for seven years now. Uh, you know, so 
um, yes, don't give up on your dream. Um, sometimes just the extra push may, may kind of maybe that step. Um, be nice to people. Uh, there are always going to be people who are around who are going to help you. Um, and, you know, it is never too late to redefine your path. Um, you know, it can be tough. Um, after working for nine, 10 years, going back into fellowship uh, was really hard emotionally and even financially because um, fellowship, they don't pay you much at all. Um, so I went, I actually took um, an 87% pay cut to go from being a general surgeon to do my fellowship. So, but that one year was worth it um, because I think um, I like doing the robots. I really love doing it. And I think the robots will even allow me to be able to lengthen my career because you actually sit down to operate. Um, you sit down behind a console. You don't have to stand for hours on end, which we used to do with laparoscopy. Um, but I can do a whole colostomy reversal sitting down, uh, which is an amazing thing. Um, anyway, so that's my story. Well, that's an amazing story, Dr. Nunu. Um, very, very amazing because you link all some of the things we're talked about. Um, the fact that some people just dread the whole gastroenterology physiology. But for you, if we could put you in a bucket filled with um, gastric juices and salivary juices, you would be <laughs> extremely happy. <laughs> you just seem to love the whole pathology and the tract and the enzymes and hormones. So you are completely at home in your field. And it seems you, you also touched on connection, just the same way I ran into Professor Ifwa and I ended up in Brazil, you used every connection that happened in your life to navigate, like you embody the topic, you really navigated your career to where you are. And you also mentioned something extremely important, which is don't be afraid to change course. You have to be bold. I mean, to go back to fellowship and be receiving the salary of a resident when you're in your, I believe you're in your forties then, it was 45. It's, it's a bold, 45. It's a bold move. And here you are, you could close your eyes and you said you could do what reversal of colostomy, right? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think your story is extremely powerful and needed to be shared. And just for disclosure purposes, some of the medical students reached out to me that for reasons unclear to me, they cannot register. And so we've gone live on YouTube. I didn't want to, but it's okay. It serves as a a recording for those who cannot reach it, except they won't have the benefit of listening to Professor Ifwa and Professor Haritabo's um, story. So thank you, Dr. Nunu. I can't thank you enough. I know you had a meeting um, probably in the next few minutes, but you stayed on to share your story. So I really appreciate that. And I think you'll be a blessing to many, many, many people. All right, so the next person to go up is another lady. I begged her to join. I said, we are, we are um, in a minority. Please, please do whatever you can to show up. So Dr. Cecilia Banga also grew up in Ghana. Um, she's an obstetrician gynecologist. She also has an amazing story where I had dinner with her one day and I'm like, wow, this woman has pushed you. Like those people who decide I am going to be successful no matter what it takes. So she's going to share her story, how she got into medical school, how she was told she couldn't go and do medicine. She found out a way while in the U.S. and what she's doing now. And she's on the board of, you know, um, OBGYN, um, national, many, she'll tell her own story. So Cecilia, you have the floor. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ai. And um, I, I wish I could see all the medical students' faces. It's always best to be able to inter interact, but I see the number of you on here and I applaud you for even looking at this because it's such an a difficult decision trying to decide the exact path you want to go to. But I guess before I say anything, I want to just assure you that as everybody has said, there's several different paths in medicine. And even if you start on one path, you can always adjust and find your own niche, um, whichever way you go. So don't feel 
don't feel that you're holed in to just one path. Um, so as Dr. Ayi said, I grew up in Ghana as well. Um, I went to university primary school. I'm a campus child. Um, my parents were on, were, um, on campus. And then I went to uh, St. Rosa's. St. Rosa's, best school ever. <laughs> I went there from form one to form five. I was in the last batch of the O-level system. And then I went on, because they didn't have science, uh, for sixth form, I went to Achimota for my sixth uh, for my sixth form. Now, at that time, there was a strike in Legon. And um, so there was a backlog of students waiting to go to university. So I was going to have to wait an additional year after my national service to go to university. So at that time, family got together, decided I should consider applying to um, schools in the US, which I did and I got accepted. Um, so I went to, I did my college education here in the States, um, Oklahoma State University. And that's when I got an awakening. My entire life, um, I had never been told that I couldn't do something that I wanted to do. Um, and this was the first time that I heard over and over again, I don't think you can make it to medical school. You're an international student. It's extremely hard to get into medical school in the US and you coming in as an international student will be even harder. So that was quite an awakening for me. Um, I actually considered going back to Ghana to um, join medical school there. Um, my father actually suggested, he was like, well, come on back. Um, my only, my only uh, deterrent was the fact that my mates who had already gone through college in Ghana would have been several years ahead of me and I'd be starting from way back. And so I figured I was going to find a way through. Um, luckily for me, in my final year of college, I um, honed on to an organization called the Sudan National Medical Association. They had a conference that I went to. For those of you who don't know, um, the Sudan National Medical Association is an organization that is made up of um, Black medical students. Um, and they had amazing conferences where they would have very, um, very prominent people come and speak to them. And um, at, at that conference in my final year of college, where I was still trying to figure out what I was doing, um, they had a career, um, a, medical a medical school fair. And at that medical school fair, I spoke to several different recruiters. And there was one particular recruiter who took the time to explain to me the entire process and said to me, don't listen to the people telling you you can't get in. Others have done it before you, you can do it too. And um, she will always have a special place in my heart. Uh, sometimes your inspiration comes from the most unexpected places. I did not expect it to be her. Um, I didn't expect to find somebody to tell me this. Um, I actually ended up going to the conference as a last minute uh, because somebody dropped out of the conference and the other students going needed a, an extra person to come so that they could cover the cost of the hotel together. Um, and so from that moment on, I was able to go ahead and um, start the process of figuring out how to write the MCATs. Nobody at this point had ever talked to me about that. And remember, I came from Ghana right after um, six forms. So I didn't have the benefit of having gone through college and all of that in Ghana and figuring out how to transition that system to here. So I had to learn all that on my own. Um, so I did, I did the MCATs. Um, I waited a year out of college, did a prep course, did the MCATs, and I got accepted coincidentally to the school that the, um, the recruiter was a part of. Um, it was the first school that offered me an acceptance and I readily accepted it. Um, up until this point, I do have to preface, other opportunities that had been given to me were to go and uh, do my medical school in the Caribbean um, and several other things. And it just all seemed too complicated to me. I was like, surely there has to be a better way. Um, my option was going to be Ghana or none, think of something else. So anyway, I did get accepted to that school. It happened to be an osteopathic medical school. So my degree is not an MD, it is a DO. And I won't go into all the depths of that. That's for another conversation, but essentially a DO is the way I like to describe it is a hands-on MD 
who also does manipulation. So not only did I learn the exact same classes that were taught in the allopathic medical uh, schools, I also learned how to do manipulation. So I can do body adjustments, which ended up being very um, um, beneficial in my chosen field. So now to my chosen field, uh, my mother was the president of the Ghana Registered Nurses Association, and she did a lot of um, um, workshops for women in public health. And I was the youngest, she had me in her 40s. So I was her little handbag. I went along with her to a lot of different um, events and I sat in on a lot of public uh, women's healthcare um, uh, forums and uh, public health um, uh, discussions that she did. So I feel like, I don't remember the exact moment when I decided women's health was going to be the field that I went into. I just feel like it was just automatically something that I was naturally drawn into. Um, the way I like to describe it is also that I went into OBGYN for selfish reasons. I think the most amazing thing that women go through is the changes that their bodies go through over the years. Sorry, men, but you guys stay almost the same all the way through. So we're a little more dynamic. We have a little more interesting journeys as our bodies age. And so I feel like I was always just drawn to all the different things I was personally going through. And it made me more inclined to want to read up more and more and more about it. I was just fascinated with that. And um, I went to a girls' school, St. Rosa's, as I said, and we tended to be, you know, we tended to talk about some of these things, you know, every now and then. And it was always very fascinating to me. So combination of following my mother around, combination of, you know, being around a lot of girls, I think that's what drew me to OBGYN. When I got to medical school, we did have an opportunity in our first year um, to shadow different fields. Um, because several people came in not knowing what they wanted to do. And I remember thinking at that time, well, I've always thought OBGYN, maybe I haven't explored the other opportunities. So I did get a chance to shadow in the ER. Um, I did general surgery. And then I think I did family medicine. And at the end of all of that, what I took away from it was, I, I'm similar to Dr. Ayi in a way, I have to have a variety of different things to keep me engaged. So I could not see myself just doing just one particular thing. Um, my attention span would not sustain me. So with OBGYN, what I love about it is I get to do office work. I get to see patients in the office. In routine annual exams, I see people from year to year. I see them progress um, from year to year. I get to know their life stories. So I get to have continuity of care with patients. But then I also get to see people through some interesting changes that their bodies go through when they're pregnant. So we, you know, we go from trying to, you know, get pregnant, um, taking care of you all through the pregnancy. And then actually at the end of it, I need to have a tangible result to hand to you. I can give you a live baby in your hands. And that is probably the most miraculous part of my job that I love. Um, that moment is so individual and personal to every single family. There's no way to replicate that um, the exact same way with every single family. All the dynamics in the room, the, the emotions, everything. I, 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 I love that aspect of it. And then there's the surgical arm with the GYN where you get to, you know, take out fibroids and, you know, um, take out ovarian cysts and do all of that. I love surgery so much that um, I also had the opportunity to um, get an amazing mentor in um, Dr. Akins, who I'm not sure if he would be here or if he was around here at all, but um, in my final year of residency, when I did my GYN oncology rotation, I was so inspired. I, surgery came naturally to me, which was a bit of a surprise because I've never been the best with blood. Um, but apparently it was just, I just needed to find the field that I wanted to be in. And um, I really enjoyed surgery so much that he actually talked to me about maybe considering a GYN oncology fellowship. And back to my original point, even though I chose OBGYN, 
I didn't have to stay as a generalist OBGYN. There are specialty fields that you can go into. You can go into reproductive endocrinology. You can go into GYN oncology. You can go into just minimally invasive surgery. You can do just obstetrics, or you can do just GYN. Or as I found, I can do a little bit of all of it. Um, so that's how I chose my trajectory. It was based on my interests. Um, that's how I chose my desired field. It was based on um, opportunity. And um, that's how I actually ended up here. As most of the people here, regardless of where you go to do your training, there's always going to be that part of you that wants to return home. And so again, through Dr. Akins, I did get a chance to do some uh, mission work in um, Ghana through his organization that comes there every year. And that's part of why I'm involved with um, Ghana Physicians and Surgeons College. So regardless of the field that you choose, just remember that you have to have a passion for it. OBGYN is not for the weak of heart. There are going to be many sleepless nights. Um, I, to this day, I don't think I can sleep more than six hours without at least my eyes automatically opening up. Um, I have perfected the art of sleeping for seven minutes. Um, since I don't drink any caffeine, that was how I powered through all those um, long hours. So you have to make sure that it is something that sustains you, is fulfilling to you, and that you can see yourself doing for a long time. The money is not a part of it at all, because when you are in the middle of a 72-hour shift, the last thing you're thinking about is the money, at least in my experience. Um, so just make sure that you're choosing fields that you have researched, that you have had some sort of experience with. If you get a chance to follow a doctor that is doing something in a field that you think you may have some interest in, follow them not just for one day, follow them maybe for the space of a whole week so that you see what it's realistically like for a whole week, not just for a couple of hours or, or a day. And make sure that you don't hesitate to ask for help when you can. Like I said, sometimes help comes in the most unexpected places. Um, and that's it. I um, also transitioned when I first finished residency. My first job was with a hospital employed group, um, which meant that I worked for the hospital and they gave me a salary. Um, over time, I realized that that was also a little more limiting for me. And I needed to have a little bit more flexibility because I am a wife, I am a mother. And I needed to have a way of combining all of those things together as well. And so I transitioned into private practice. So I'm currently in private practice. Um, I have four other partners, but the whole practice has, uh, let's see, five, six, seven doctors and two nurse practitioners. Um, so it's a great team. Make sure that you choose a team of people that you like to work with. Um, you bring all the stress from work home. And so if there's a lot of it, you're going to bring that home as well. And it's going to affect your quality of life. Uh, but if it's people that you enjoy working with, that's not as much stress to bring home. And um, let's see. Yeah, so I transitioned into private practice. I do have a little bit more flexibility in terms of my work schedule. It's never 100%. I can't just automatically get up and say, I'm not going to work tomorrow. There are patients that you have to be responsible for. So you have to keep that in mind. But um, I do have more flexibility than I would have otherwise. And um, that's that's my journey so far. Um, Dr. Ayi mentioned um, being involved in some national organizations. Again, I have to have my hands in different things. So um, I did join the um, American College of Osteopathic OBGYNs. I do happen to be the chair for their uh, medical education conferences. So I help organize the medical education conferences from year to year. And through that, I was able to um, work with the American College of um, American Osteopathic Association to come to Ghana to help um, talk to other um, 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 medical boards um, in the whole African region. It was an organization called AMCOA. And I came as part of the organization to come to explain what an osteopathic um, physician is so that now osteopathic physicians from the United States can help, um, can ease their transitioning of credentialing processes in Ghana. So there's, even though I'm an OBGYN, there's other ways that you can still fulfill 
your career ambitions. And for me, being able to provide back in Ghana has always been part of that as well. So that's my story. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Banga. Um, I know it's been a sacrifice. Most of you don't know this, but it's 7 a.m. on the East Coast. So it means she probably had to get up around 5 a.m. just to do this. So that's a remarkable story. Um, I'll come back and make comments on what she said, but I just want to encourage the panelists and let them know that they're making a huge difference. We have 152 Hopefully all medical students logged on and online um, YouTube, there are 27 people watching. So together about 180. And I wasn't going to stream live, like I said, but I got a request. So um, sometimes you have to adapt quickly in life. And so um, our next three speakers I have not introduced. They have such long CVs that I'll let them do it themselves. And up is going to be Professor Daniel Ansong. Um, we've interacted virtually. This is the first time seeing him um, face to face virtually. He would be speaking next. And next will be Dr. Kwabna Edu Intoso, who, um, before he speaks, I will tell you what I know about him that he, I was told that he was the um, encyclopedia on, on, on wheels because he went to Massachusetts Institute of Technology to study, was it chemistry or physics? And he was, he is super, super, super smart and became a nephrologist. So he will speak next. And then Professor Vincent is in a whole category, Vincent in Japan. He's won so many awards. I'm sure his um, academic accolades alone can fill a book. And he was a frequent personality in Ghana. He got burnt a little bit. So he's not into global mental health. So that would be the order. But just to piggyback on Dr. Cecilia Banga, her story is also quite riveting. Um, it illustrates many, many key things to be successful in life. She refused to take no for an answer that she could not go to medical school. She kept on knocking the doors. I mean, most of you listening have already been to me or are in medical school, but there's another barrier you'd face in life. People who tell you you can't do something. And then the other important thing about her story is what I call divine connections. People who out of the blue come into your life, look you in the eye and tell you you can do this. So that recruiter was like a miracle. Not only did she or he tell, let her know that she could go to medical school, ended up helping her find a medical school. So I think that's amazing. And then she also focuses on mentorship. So unbeknownst to her, I actually heard about her name. I mean, I didn't connect it till now, like real this moment that she's the one that I was told about this doctor who sued her the doctor of osteopathy degree became accepted by the Ghana, Med I mean, the Medical and Dental Council. So she was the one. Um, and then secondly, um, Dr. Akins also shared with me about this medical student who just loved OBGYN and he was trying to get her to do I mean, Ghana oncology. And finally, it was actually Dr. Akins' wife who told him that, you know what? let this young lady do what she wants. Don't, don't force her to do something she doesn't like. So he has shared that story with me, but today I'm kind of connecting all the dots. So um, the mentors in your life, put your ears on the ground, whatever you do, do it passionately. And I think she, even though OBGYN is tough, but it looks like she's gotten used to it. I mean, not many people, some people don't even want to do medicine. I've spoken to a lot of young people. They say, oh, it's too long, it's too this. But clearly she's loving it to the point of not having enough sleep is an okay thing for her. She's doing it and being a blessing to humanity. So um, Dr. Banga, thank you for being here. Um, March 8th will be International Women's Day. And we're, I think the theme is, um, inclusiveness and equity or something like that. So you needed to be here so that the girls will know that you don't just, you're not just a good cook in the kitchen. You can be a professional woman and be extremely successful because you were born to fulfill a purpose and you have children, you've written books, you're an amazing wife, you're a good cook, you're a good child to um, your parents. So thank you for being here and sharing your story. So um, Dr. Professor Anson, thank you for being on time and then waiting patiently for an hour till everybody said their spiel. So please go ahead, you have the floor. 
I think you are muted. Right. So most grateful to be part of this interaction and, and hi to all my medical students who have joined um, this, this platform and um, my colleague facilitators who are there. Thank you also for availing yourself. So the my my story is also a story that is sometimes I tell students and um, I've been saying it's for quite a long time. Now, it's very good to give some perspective for um, the current generation to understand what it is that they have and opportunities available to them. Right from, um, let's say, 70s, 80s, 90s, and part of the 2000s, the, 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 the only option for you was to do the West African exams or go to South Africa, go to New Zealand, go to Europe, go to the US or go to the Canada. The West African exam was a no-go area. You, you go in 20 of you, five of you, and if you are lucky to be only one person. So when you attempt after medical school to even do the West Africa, some of the narrative is, well, why do you want to go and do this? And all the direction was to, to, to the Europe to, to do club or to South Africa. At that time, South Africa had opened its doors post-1992, the independence. And so a lot of Ghanaians, Nigerians were going into South Africa. And myself and Harry uh, were among those who were preparing to actually write a South African practice exams when on the month that we're about to go, they decided to cancel because the wave of Nigerians that were moving to South Africa, they decided to cancel that of the, the West Africa groups coming to Niger um, South Africa. So the option was either to go to the US, to go to UK, or to look for New Zealand. But these were areas where communications to that area, there were no mobile phones, there were no internet to, to do any communication of that nature. You have to write and go to the post office and expect a response by, by hard copy. So we, we had to survive all those. And, and at one point in time, I decided that, okay, after school 1993, completed my house job, then this joined the sickle cell clinic, which was a new program that was coming up. So I became a sickle cell um, practitioner or clinician in the clinic and hoping to use that to get a USMLE offer and move out. And somehow mentors are very important in this endeavor. When you have a very good mentor, you. Uh, I was there when the mentor approached me that there's a research that they think I am. I would if I would want to join. And so I joined the research. And during that research, um, I felt that I was gaining some bit of training. In, in that time, I hadn't thought of doing research, but it was during the research when our collaborators came and asked them, a few things about research capacity. And myself and one Dr. Alice also for it, we were immediately given opportunity to go to Johns Hopkins to do a six weeks epidemiology and biostatistics training. That was very revealing when we attended that program as EMUs. So when I came back, I decided that, okay, let me pay attention to research. At the same time, work with my either my USMLD or my West Africa. So we, we started learning. At that time, when you are learning USMLD, you are using Ghanaian textbooks, there's nothing on the system for you to use. And I remember we, we did our USML exams at the British Council opposite the city house, full of Nigerians, few of us Ghanaians in there. And at the end of that exam, we felt the exams were so difficult because we have not heard about blood gases, but we were answering questions on blood gases, acidosis, and all those things that you need to interpret it and get results. Amazingly, we passed it all, part one, step one, step two. And so when I, when I meet my students, I show them my, my results and I say, hey, prof. Now, what happened? Immediately, we decided that we would do the West African exam as well at the same time. Because I told my colleagues that if we had learned for the West, the, the, the USMLD, then we should as well also, whilst you are in Ghana, you should as well also sit for the West Africa because there was no Ghana college. And so we, we sat the exam. And at the end of the exam, I told my colleagues that we would pass this exam because the, the nature of the 
USMLE and the West Africa, there's no way we would not be able to pass. And the results came and we had passed the primaries. It means that we are having our foot now in Ghana. So we decided that, okay, we'll, we'll try the part one. And the part one, you had to go to Nigeria in a different terrain. And we started the exams in Nigeria. At that time, we had our predecessors, only two of them going to pass pediatrics. And we were three who went to Nigeria the following year, and I was the only one who passed. The other two could have passed the exam, but the issue of language barrier and other challenges, they couldn't pass. I did mine in April, in September, they went to pass. And so we sort of, oh, now the Ghana West African exam can be passed now. That was in 2000. And so we came back as specialists now in the system with pediatrics as a background. I was still in the research arena. Now, there was this call from WHO GSK wanting to train fellows in fellowship in clinical research capacity building. I applied. I was one day on the wall doing rounds when I had a call that oh, we've had a call from Switzerland and we, we, they said they want to talk to you. And when I went, there was this lady who said, We've reviewed your application, and there were 40 applicants with shortly test to 10. And your application, you appear to be overqualified for the position. And then I said, Oh, okay, but um, I'm not sure I'm overqualified because the research capacity development program that I applied to, I think it will be good for me to be part. So they interviewed me and they told me they'll be back. After now, they called back that they've shortly said almost, and I've been part of the first three, and that we are to come to Switzerland for a final face to face. So, within two, three weeks, I was at the airport going to Switzerland just for an interview for 45 minutes. Went to Switzerland, one, one guy from Burkina Faso, myself, and one guy from um, Cameroon. When we got there in the morning, they said the Cameroonian lost, missed his flight then I knew that the probability is now 50%. <laughs> From 30% to 50%. So we, we, we went in two interview rooms, and these are some of the things that I would want our students to pay attention to. I'm very unprepared, but in mind, I was very prepared because I've been told I was overqualified <laughs> and that they just wanted me to come for the interview. And now, one hour in one room, one hour in the other room, and... Uh, after the interview, let me cut my test short. Um, they came back to me one on one and said, "We, we, you have come here to confirm our, 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 our impression that you are overqualified, and so we, we are unable to offer you the fellowship program. However, WHO has a program in South Africa, an MSc in epidemiology and biostatistics, that we would want to offer you. Would you, would you want it?" Then I, I said, yes, I would, I would go. And so long story short, I went to South Africa, did the MSc in epidemiology and biostatistics, came back. And when I came back, my mentor had then gotten some few grants and I supported him to do most of these grants. And then we launched ourselves into the malaria vaccine initiative and we were given the malaria vaccine trial. Around the same time, then the Ghana College had become very good and so more people are joined and we all joined the Ghana College and also applied to the Research and Development Unit of Confanochi Teaching Hospital as a Deputy Director for Research and Development, which I got the offer. So I was there 2011 to 2009. And so I was doing both pediatrics and clinical research and a bit of um, epidemiology and biostatistics at the same time. But my inclination was to do more of the capacity building undergraduate training and I thought that, okay, with my current position, my next level is either to become the dean or the vice dean, so I need to prepare myself to, to that position. So most of the things that I, I did on my own, for which the students should pay attention to, they need to take initiatives on their own. There is a community in Ghana called Barakesi. There's a smaller one called Barakuma. 
I, I started a surveillance program that looking at pediatric diseases in these populations. And two years after that, I had collaborators from University of Utah joining me to do a whole pick of programs there where we started going into community development. So cheap compounds were built. We built three cheap compounds. We built um, toilet facilities. We built classrooms and all those things. These are things that were done on the on the side, even though we were looking at disease bedding and how to prevent them with this. At the same time, took the initiative to bring our medical students on board, as well as the university students from University of Utah on a yearly basis and take them to the rural communities to do community diagnosis, community disease um, management, and that kind of things. And this program is still running since 2004, where University of Utah bring students in. These are some of the things that um, the panel um, for the um, deanship um, selection and um, field villain and made me also got to the position to become the dean. Becoming the dean has been very challenging, but a lot of opportunities available that I would always want to bring to the students. I've come to find out that in Ghana, our basic sciences needs a lot of capacity that is clinicians who can support the basic sciences. Currently, we the country lacks a lot of pathologists, clinical microbiologists, anatomists, physiologists, behavioral sciences who have clinical background. And so we need individuals who have MBCHB who would want to divert. So it's not the traditional child health, obstetrics and gynecology, and medicine and internal medicine. But these areas are also there. We, my recommendation is that as they still pay attention to the traditional areas, they still can look at MPhil and PhD into this um, subspecialty or preclinical sciences and join us. It will interest them to know that since I became the dean, I have been able to bring 10 doctors who are currently in several year one, year two of their training doing MPhil in physiology, five doing MPhil in clinical microbiology, two doing MPhil in molecular medicine, but there are few. We need more medical schools in Ghana now, but before we can build very good medical schools in Ghana, we need the basic sciences. And therefore, they need to pay attention and join their colleagues who are now joining them. Immediately they are done with their MPhil, they are being attracted by the US institutions to come and do the PhDs. So all the 10 are now getting recommendation letters from me to go and do the PhDs in physiology, clinical microbiology. And my, my, my understanding is that they're going to come back and they will be the next generation of our medical schools in, in, in Ghana. We need more of them to, to pay attention to that. The other options that they can, they can look at, apart from the, the you going through the traditional area, the option of pharma, that is the pharmaceutical areas, clinical trials, who, who would judge the disease outcomes when we don't have our clinicians being interested in clinical trials? It's very, very important that um, they pay attention to that and join the Novartis and join the the, the, the GSKs and doing all the pharma areas in the area of research and clinical capacity building so that they can come back. Our current drive to have um, a vaccine program in Ghana that the, the, the president is, is pushing, which is a very loud of ideas. We need some capacity there, the clinicians with clinical research knowledge, top notch type to be able to run the vaccine programs, to be able to do the monitoring and the evaluations because they understand what it is that they need to, to learn. And therefore, my students, you are the next generation. Beta, Kwabna, myself, and Cecilia, Prof. Vicent, we, 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 we are almost there. And we need to bring you guys to hold the fort. We are doing this because we need the next generation. And we, we don't want you to be just all the way out and not having your, your directions clear. 
We're always available to help and we hope that you would contact us. You would contact us means that you need our direct link. I have over 1,500 medical students and I hope some of them are here and I probably less than 1% have my contact. That is, that is not fair to yourself and to myself as well because if we want to lift you up and you are not contacting us and getting close to us, I don't think it is good enough. So come to us and those faculty members, whether in UG, USD, please do not be afraid of any of your faculty members. Go to them and let them mentor you. Thank you very much. Oh, Prof. Anson, this was amazing. I mean, you yourself know that you've done a terrific job. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough. And um, I just want to add something in Akan. I hope all of you can understand. It means the the chicken, <laughs> the, the 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 chicken that's close to the mother hen, is the one who gets to eat the thigh of the grasshopper. Otherwise, you won't get. So uh, he's make a very very important point that very few people have his information. Please reach out to him and um, let him guide you. Don't be out there in the open. And I want to thank you all once again for joining. Um, we're expecting two more people, Professor Tebri, the um, Dean at uh, University of Health and Allied Sciences, and um, Dr. Professor Ohine, um, Sami Ohine. He said he hadn't gotten the link or he just saw the message to join. And all of you, I have to say, a lot of these people, I call them on short notice just this week. So I really appreciate the sacrifice. I think this would have been very boring, just me talking to all these um, students. So thank you. And I just want to make highlight a few things that Professor Daniel Anson said. All these panelists, I almost think that if, I, if a publisher were to reach out to you, everybody's story deserves a whole book for other people to learn from. What a story. And um, Professor Daniel, I know Alex also for it very well. We all, we all did microbiology. In fact, we interviewed for medical school together and he went to SMS and I went to UGMS, but our parts have crossed because he's into microbiology and occasionally he will attend Infectious Disease Society of America um, conferences. So we keep in touch every now and then. But he yeah. made very, very important observations. One, um, basic sciences is open. Please don't forget it. But I like to appeal. Like me, for example, I can't see why I can't teach anatomy extremely well because I love anatomy. But then you have to have PhD in Ghana in anatomy before you can teach it. Really, what is it? We, sometimes we have to demystify medicine. One, we make it so fearful. The medical students are always afraid that will fail. So we are all human beings. It's just that some of us have decided we'll take care of sick people. If you think about it, Medicine is so simple. It's so simple. I mean, when you are done with medicine and you sit back, you have to learn how the anatomy, how the body is structured, the nerves, the muscles. Then physiology, you learn how it functions. Like um, Dr. Um, uh, Nunu was saying, he loves the whole gastroenterology. Then you learn pathology. What happens to it when it's sick? Then you learn pharmacology, how to treat it. You are done. Why should this be a fearful venture? Our brothers and sisters have also joined this. Yours is to just figure it out and treat it. But we've made it into this fearful monster. The students are always afraid. I'm going to feel, oh, welcome, Professor Hine. He made it. I'm going to feel, I mean, not, like, let's demystify the medicine, the teaching of it. The students should be excited going on rounds. I'm going to learn about the human body. So that's just, and then you so mentioned opportunities that came your way within three weeks you are at the airport you went for this interview and then they gave you something else and your life just took on six weeks in Johns Hopkins you came back thinking about research in fact you also embody the navigation it's not going to be a straightforward journey opportunities will come open your ears your heart your eyes and you will be elevated to the high. Look at him. Now he said, Dean, I'm sure he has a huge office air condition. He flies Whoa. around the world when he wants. He had no idea this is where his life was going to be, but he's here because he allowed the, 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 the life. In fact, Oprah has an interesting saying. 
She said, let the mothership, I don't know if it means the Holy Spirit. Or, he said, let the mothership lead you. Events will guide you. Don't, don't, don't stress about your life at all. Don't worry. I think that's what Jesus said. We shouldn't worry about anything. The things will happen by themselves. And one more thing he mentioned that was also um, interesting is something I've told the medical students in Ghana over and over again. Mary Furiata may be on here. She asked me when she, I was in UHAS, should she travel or should she stay in Ghana? I tell you, when you're in Ghana, half of my class is in Ghana. And if you look at them, in fact, if you take any medical school class and you look at those who stayed in Ghana and where they are now, and those who went abroad, yes, those who went abroad, they may have nice houses. They are sick. I'm not, with all due respects to Dr. Ntosu and uh, Cecilia Banga, but you get to this place and you are there. You will just, if you're in Ghana, you will become a global icon. I always say my classmate is the chief CEO of Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Another of my classmates, uh, Dr. Franklin uh, uh, Bequin. Mm. He is head of public health, director of public health in the whole of Ghana. I have another one who is head of Focus Hospital. Um, I can go on and on. Professor Akpalu is head of neuro, neuro, neurology. Um, I can go on and on. My, my classmate is the dean of uh, University of Cape Coast Medical School. In fact, he couldn't be here. Um, he, he couldn't be here because um, he had, it was short notice. Um, but I'm just letting you know, if you have to stay in Ghana, tell yourself this is the best. I'm, you're going to make huge world impact. Look at Professor Ifwa. So I don't want to belabor the point that staying in Ghana, if there's an opportunity for a world conference, they want one representative. They'll come to Ghana and pick you. The, your colleagues abroad, they'll, have, they'll be competing with Caucasians and 300 other people. They won't even put you on the short list. So please think carefully about quickly wanting to migrate out of Ghana and uh, make a good career decision. So Prof, thank you very much. We'll come to you with questions. So the next person to go is Dr. Kwabna Ntoso, and he would tell us his own life history. All I want you to remember is the Encyclopedia on Wheels, Massachusetts Institute of Technology a graduate who went to do nephrology, who is now retired. So, and then Professor Samuel, he thank you so much for joining us on short notice. You will speak after your colleague, um, Dr. Professor Vincent Japon speaks. So, Doc, and you are on mute. So please remember that uh, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Ayi for <clears throat> inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. Um, <clears throat> my story is a little bit more boring and not as you know, glorifying as all the other uh, individuals. I am really privileged to be part of this quite uh, prominent um, you know, panel. Um, as I did grow up in Ghana. I went to uh, secondary school at Opokuari and um, finished the sixth form in 1971. Uh, my story goes back why I decided to go into medicine in the first place. I was, uh, I think, in this form two or form three at Opokuari when one day my father knocked on our door. There were four of us who slept in one room and said, your mother died. I had seen my mother just you know, a few days before she was pregnant. Uh, I said, what happened? She said she delivered and she hemorrhaged to death. Yes. So at that point, as a form two uh, student at Apokowari, you know, went through everything else and I made a resolution to myself that I was going to try to help <laughs> in the future so other women don't have to go through uh, that process. And I said I was going to be a doctor, and more importantly, be a doctor to help women <laughs> not to go through that. Um, my problem was I hated biology. <laughs> I truly hated memorizing. <laughs> Physics, math, give it to me any day, and that's what I would do. Uh, numbers were my game. So how was I going to become a doctor if I hated biology and all that? Um, indeed, I went on 
through sixth form, did physics, chemistry, and math, uh, did very well, uh, but still wanted to do medicine and applied to Ghana Medical School and did get in. Uh, Professor Ifua uh, Hesse was actually my classmate in the what then was the pre-medical class for those of us who didn't do biology. Uh, and then we had to do the first year after that. So, While I was at Abukwari, I also applied to a college in the US, to MIT, because I love physics, I love math, I wanted to be an engineer if I couldn't be a doctor. Um, and as fate would have it, while I was uh, at the Ghana Medical School in pre-medical class, I, just before our first university exam, the FUE at the time, I got an acceptance letter from MIT uh, with a full scholarship. So here was the dilemma. A conundrum, I want to be a doctor, <clears throat> but here is this opportunity I've always wanted to be. Uh, and, and also I knew that going to the United States would offer me some kind of financial assistance to be able to help my family back at home, which I couldn't do if I stayed in Ghana. Uh, all my classmates said, why are you even bothering to take the examination? Why didn't you go? I said, no, I'm going to do this on my own terms. When you finish the exam, pass it, make sure that I have that choice whether I go or do not go. Um, so fast forward, I was able to come to the US. Unfortunately, I had to leave the Ghana Medical School <laughs> the first year. I came here, went to MIT, and um, I was about two and a half years into that. I still wanted to go to medical school. I had an advisor who said, don't even try, as Dr. Ba has said, you will not get in, so difficult school. So I applied for graduate work, got accepted to MIT uh, for graduate, postgraduate uh, work if I wanted to. Uh, so two and a half years into my uh, undergraduate, while I was doing a combined bachelor's master's degree, I applied to medical school anyway, <laughs> against the advice of my advisor, and uh, got accepted <laughs> you know, to medical school. Um, so. I graduated, I, I completed my undergraduate uh, in three years and then went to medical school uh, after that uh, at Einstein. Um, I always, as I said, wanted to be an obstetrician because of my mother's uh, situation, uh, but I still had this problem with, I'm not a hands-on person for a surgery and everything else. And uh, what am I going to do? <laughs> I love numbers. Obstetricians don't do numbers. <laughs> and so I uh, met my wife then at uh, uh, medical school. And mm -hmm. uh, as fate would have it, uh, she decided she was going to be an obstetrician. I said, oh, great. <laughs> now I have somebody who can perhaps carry on the mantle that I wanted to do uh, without me personally being involved. And I also happened to have an advisor at that time who was a nephrologist, a truly, truly wonderful, bright man, um, and who really, you know, put me onto um, nephrology. Uh, prior to going to medical school, I had actually had the opportunity to uh, counsel with uh, uh, one of our prominent Ghanaians who unfortunately recently died, uh, Dr. Henry from Bond, uh, who was uh, here at that time at Yale, uh, quite unfortunate. Uh, and he gave me a lot of advice as well. So uh, I finished medical school. I then entered residency training at the uh, university and you know, not to blow and <laughs> toot my horn, but I think I was the first black person admitted to that residency and became the chief resident at that time at that hospital uh, as well. And uh, finished four years of residency uh, and then decided to pursue my passion in numbers as a nephrologist. So I applied to the University of Pennsylvania and also got accepted uh, there, I got accepted to many. Places. So I chose to go to University of Pennsylvania because they were a very strong um, numbers place, electrolytes and everything else. And uh, I had this dilemma of, I want to be 
a university professor. I want to teach. I want to do research. But I also have a family back home in Ghana that I need to support. <laughs> I need to be able to you know, send money home, all the siblings, my father, everything else. Uh, and it becomes a very difficult you know, uh, thing. But I made the choice after spending some time in the research lab that that was not going to be my you know, passion. I, wanted to, I enjoyed being with patients. I enjoyed teaching medical students, but I didn't want to spend my time in the lab you know, doing stuff. Uh, so I applied after my fellowship and luckily was able to get a clinical position uh, at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is one of the University of Pennsylvania uh, affiliates. Um, and I moved on into clinical practice uh, at that time as a private practitioner. And I was perhaps one of about three or four black physicians at the hospital uh, at that time. Uh, all my partners were, you know, white. I think everybody was surprised, you know, why, what's this guy doing here? But uh, over time, um, I grew to become actually the chief uh, of, of the renal section at the hospital. Uh, from 2004 until, as you heard, I just recently uh, retired. Uh, in, the, um, in the course of all that, um, I think you've heard many times, teaching is my passion. And I think it's so, so very important for those of us who have gone through it uh, to really be good teachers for you know the students, for the residents, for every uh, person uh, involved. And that has been my passion teaching uh, in uh, my career. I have also participated in a lot of clinical studies. I was principal investigator in a lot of uh, drugs uh, development uh, in yeah, nephrology. Uh, so as uh, also you've heard, that's critically important in terms of bringing things uh, to the uh, forefront in medicine for us uh, in teaching. Um, I was instrumental in setting up the first uh, I was medical director of dialysis facilities and also instrumental in setting up the first home dialysis training centers in the city of Philadelphia, uh, home dialysis for peritoneal dialysis and also for home hemodialysis. And I was medical director of that facility uh, as well uh, in then. Um, we all we need mentors. Dr. Ansa mentioned quite probably how important it is to have a mentor, uh, and we all need to strive uh, to do that. And if for the medical students, it's critically important that you really can you know talk to individuals who've been through it. Everybody has a different pathway. Everybody has you know different uh, ways to get to uh, a point. Um, money has been mentioned. Uh, there are people who make choices based on money. You can say part of mine was money-based because I had to support my family, uh, but money should not be the dominant reason. Uh, you need to make sure you are interested and that you are happy and that you have a passion for what you decide to do. Uh, one of the things I tell everybody is as a doctor, and again, this is my experience in the US, you'll never be unemployed. You always have a job. Uh, you have to make sure that you are interested because what you choose is going to be your lifetime in experience. And there's, you know, I couldn't be an obstetrician because I could, just could not see myself sitting <laughs> by a pregnant woman for, <laughs> for 24 hours in labor. And I decided, <laughs> you know, way ahead that I couldn't do that. Uh, you have to be interested in that. Uh, you have to be interested you know, to do that. So choose uh, either it's a residency or a pathway that clinically you know you'll have a passion for and that you can, excuse me, uh, be interested in. Uh, you know, you should, Professor Tobo uh, mentioned, you know, be ready to explore. You know, that you can't just, don't get pigeonholed into one thing in the beginning. Explore and let things flow and see where, you know, where and how things go. Um, I'm going to stop here in the interest of time, uh, but that's been my pathway 
Uh, luckily, as I said, my wife is an obstetrician and she's pursuing that. And fast forward, one of my daughters is now in her second year of obstetric residency uh, here as well. So um, I think I have <laughs> achieved what I started as a form two student <laughs> to do. So that's about my story. Not as exciting as uh, <laughs> it is. It is. It is very exciting. Thank you so much. Um, so in our lineup, we have three more speakers. Uh, Dr. Professor Vincent is coming up. Um, very interesting story. Professor Ohine is coming up. He taught me psychiatry, but he doesn't know this. But he's one of the reasons why I fell in love with psychiatry. Um, I, I, I remember learning so much under, you know, just sitting under him as a medical student. So you come less. And last but not the least will be Professor Stephen Terry, the Dean of the um, University of Development, uh, UDS Medical School. But there's a few comments on uh, Dr. Intosu. So interestingly, when he finishes from, I was being born 1971, he finishes from, so enough respects. <laughs> Yesterday I was talking to some people, they, they, a few of the young ladies, um, when I finished from five in 1987, they were now being born. I felt ancient. And now um, you were born when, I was born when you finished this form. And <laughs> the other thing is, I just love microbiology and biology and to think that you absolutely hate it. <laughs> but incidentally, I love physics and chemistry as well, but it, your story illustrates a point. Um, I was telling some people the other day that you should never compare your life to anybody because you're one in a billion. In fact, yeah. you are super, super unique. And to use two biblical stories, um, Joseph is the only one that I know of who went into a foreign land, was in prison for 13 years and became a prime minister. Paul is the only one that I've heard of that a light shone from heaven onto him, and he wrote half of the New Testament. There's nobody like them. So similarly, your life is super, super unique. Um, and now that we've understood neuroscience, we know that there are different parts of the brain that have affinity for different things. Music, there are people who can construct musical notes just waking up in the morning. There are people who cannot even learn music, even if you put them in a music school. So everybody's unique. So, as a point of picking up from his story, as a medical student, realize your own uniqueness and pursue that. Don't try to copy people. We can mentor you as much as we want, but you are unique. So, try to fulfill your uniqueness. And he has a knack for physics and math. And he went into nephrology. They calculate fluids. They're always doing potassium, sodium. Uh, me too, acid bases. Every time I have to revise acid bases to, to <laughs> interpret my, but he is doing it on a daily basis. And I'm sure he can calculate, tell you metabolic acidosis from even in his sleep. So focus on what you want. And then he also mentioned academia and the balancing the, the, the need for money with your career. I mean, we're saying it's not important, but I remember about 10 years ago, I told my dad that, look, I'm ready to come home. He's like, hey, I do a now, but he said, I should consider what I sent to him in remittances and that stay puts for a while. So you have to balance all those things. So thank you very much, uh, Doc. Uh, please stay on. And Professor Vincent, thank you for being patient for almost an hour before it's your turn. So you have the floor. Thank you. No, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, greetings to the other panelists. Uh, I think I, I know a few, a few of them. Uh, my story is uh, one that's uh, based on opportunity and uh, certainly uh, people being very gracious enough to uh, give me the uh, support to be able to uh, get to where I am today. I uh, graduated from KNUSD, I think in 2001. Throughout my medical school, everybody knew I was interested in public health and really not very much interested in uh, clinical uh, medicine. Uh, so in my medical school days with my classmates, we did form uh, an organization, the Community Impact Organization. I was the president. My classmates were, you know, regional directors. Whilst we were on vacation in the first and second year, we would go to schools and 
other communities to go and provide, you know, community education and so on and so forth. So that's where my passion was and not very much in, uh, you know, the clinical work. So after medical school, I did apply to a couple of schools in the US to go and do public health. I wanted to do international uh, health and I secured admission to a couple of them, but no scholarship. So it was uh, very challenging. Uh, you know, you can't just go and pay all these school fees. So the suggestion was, oh, come to London, you know, do your plab, just get in the job. You can be able to do, keep on applying. And uh, if you're able to secure the funding, you go, otherwise you can be able to raise some funds to pay your own fees. At the time I was advised when I got to London that psychiatry was the easiest uh, field, you know, to be able to get because really the goal was just to raise some funds. It wasn't really to, to actually, you know, uh, get a career out of any clinical uh, discipline. So I uh, did a plab. I uh, did some, I think six months of attachment in Stephen H Hospital, uh, close to London and uh, applied for over 300 jobs and got only one interview. It was in 2004 at the same time that the 10 countries joined the European Union. You know, so Poland and all those people were rushing to the UK and they were giving them the jobs and not, not offering job opportunities to those of us who didn't have the work permit. In fact, at the point in time, my visa had been expired and I had to go back home <laughs> to go and try to renew you know, the visa. So at the same time, there was a friend in uh, Dublin who uh, was working there, Nigerian colleague, we did a club together and he had gone uh, to Ireland. And uh, he said, uh, Vincent, you are just wasting your time. I remember the one interview that I got was in uh, Newcastle. And Newcastle, there are two Newcastles in the UK. There's one Newcastle upon Tyne and Newcastle on the line. So the interview I actually got was in Newcastle on the line. But in my excitement getting the interview, I jumped on the bus, the train that was going to Newcastle uh, upon Tyne. And uh, I got there, you know, looked for the hospital, went there, I showed them the letter. They said, no, no, this is about 200 miles away, you know. But fortunately it was, it was, it was uh, in the afternoon and because of not wanting to be late, I left at dawn, you know, to go. So I still had about four hours window. So, so I jumped in another train and was able to make it and uh, I didn't get it, you know, so, I started applying for jobs in Dublin. And uh, fortunately for me, I applied for seven jobs in Ireland and uh, I secured two interviews, one in Letikeni, that's in the North rural place and uh, was getting ready to go for it. When the second one that I went for interview, they called me that somebody had dropped. You know, that was just two weeks to starting off of, of the job. So I, I started the job in Dublin completed my membership, UK membership in 2008, and uh, had a plan of really returning home. At the time, the only psychiatrist at Confanochi Teaching Hospital who had taught us, you know, had also retired, you know, Professor Yao, uh, he, he had retired. And, and so I went to Ghana, I went to meet Dr. Kwasiose, went to Confanochi, you know, met a number of different people. I told my wife I'm coming home, you know, because uh, there are very few psychiatrists uh, back home and my wife, you know, was not very keen on, on me returning and obviously my family because of all the uh, support that you provide as well, you know, so I made a decision then how can I be able to contribute back home even if I remain abroad. So I applied for higher specialist training. I was the first senior registrar to be appointed to St. Patrick's University Hospital in Dublin, I was offered an assistant professor job at uh, University of Dublin Trinity College at the same time. And uh, I began the intermedical student public speaking competition in 2010. And uh, through that initiative, we've had about 30 Ghanaian medical students that have undertaken four weeks of uh, electives in uh, St. Patrick's University Hospital in St. John of God. The last batch actually won just before the pandemic. And because of that, they didn't travel. I've been in touch with them recently 
and they are going to go for their elective. They have now graduated. They are going for their elective in July. So we are hoping to resume the intermedical student public speaking competition. At the same time, I began going to KNUST, you know, to teach annually at my own cost, you know, between 2008 and 2013 when I left uh, Canada. And uh, suddenly I felt very proud of, you know, the contribution that I made, even though I wasn't uh, in Ghana. So whilst in St. Patrick's University Hospital, and that's where opportunity and uh, grace and the favor uh, comes in, my uh, supervisor, Professor Declan McLaughlin, just, uh, just uh, called me one day and said, I want to sponsor you for a PhD. So just come with a topic that you want to do. You know, so I was on vacation and he texted me and uh, I kind of uh, went to meet with him when I returned. And, and uh, I did my first uh, PhD in, in clinical psychiatry at the University of Dublin. But throughout all of that time, I still wanted to do public health. You know, it was something that I still really wanted to do. So after my training, I, I enrolled again for another PhD at the Center for Global Mental Health at Trinity College to do a PhD in global mental health. I continued to do that whilst I left uh, Canada and uh, finished that in 2016. But before leaving Ireland in 2013, Ireland is a very conservative country where it's very difficult for them to keep permanent jobs, you know, to uh, foreigners, you know. So they train a lot of people, but then they won't give you a permanent job. You'll be in a locum locum uh, position, you know. So before leaving Ireland in 2013, I applied to one job at the University of Dublin Trinity College. There were 20 people that were shortlisted for interview. 11 of them were Irish. Four of them were Irish who had been sent to the UK to go and train so that they bring them back. And the remaining were also IMGs, you know, just like myself. Despite there being 11 Irish, they offered a job to me. And uh, I was so excited. You know, I told my friends who are living in Canada, I'm not going to follow you guys. And then the next week, you know, the government put a moratorium on hiring into the public service. So I had a job, but then I can't start this job because of the moratorium, you know. So after six months being in a locum, waiting for the moratorium to be lifted, before I came in, I, I started a job. My colleagues in, in Canada, you know, kept telling me about all the wonderful things that they're experiencing, the money and all those kind of stuff. You know, why are you waiting for a job that may never come? What if they don't even recognize, you know, the interview that they did? So I did the, the, the Canadian exam. It's just a basic exam you have to do of all the obstetrics, gynecology, and all the other subjects. And I, I took a job in rural Alberta. It's actually Fort McMurray, where they do all the oil mines. And uh, there was a wildfire there in 2016, uh, if, if, if people recall. So I mean, coming from Dublin and then moving to a rural part of of Alberta, you know, I remember going on a side visit with my wife and uh, the airport looked like a war zone. It's as if it's military flights, you know, <laughs> that, that leave from there. There was nothing, you know, uh, abroad or Canadian about, about the place at all. We could smell gas fumes, you know, as we were driving through the city. And I was just looking at my wife, you know, and her reaction. So fortunately we got to, uh, Nigerian colleague's home, and it was beautiful home, you know, with all his big cars, the wife's big cars, and all those kind of stuff. And I was just looking at my wife very closely to see what <laughs> would be. So that was a saving grace. So I took up that job, stayed there for three years. I moved to Edmonton. In three years there, they, they offered me the job of zone chief for community mental health for the Edmonton zone and also the director of the Division of Community Psychiatry at the University of Alberta. I was there for five years. I got tired of the job. I wanted to move on. So I applied to the department head there at the University of Alberta, the University of Saskatchewan, and also Dalhousie University. So all the interviews happened during the pandemic. I didn't even do a side visit here or go to Saskatchewan. And within two weeks period, I got all three jobs 
offered to me. I was in a big dilemma. I mean, I better where I was. They wanted me to stay. The dean asked for my wife's number to try and convince my wife for me to stay. The, in Alberta, you know, they called the president, CEO of the health authority, you know, uh, Vena Yu, you know, she called me, he said, Vincent, you can't leave Alberta. It's a bigger province. Tell me what you want. You know, we'll do whatever you want for you to stay. You know, so they offered me a research chair for Alberta Health Services in addition, you know, to the department head job there. But all the, that didn't really excite me because, I mean, I was just thinking it's time for me to move. And so I moved here over to their house in September last year. And I've been the department head as well as the, the chief of psychiatry for the Nova Scotia Health Authority. So the house university covers three provinces. We cover the Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and also Prince Edward Island. So they have 250, 66 faculty actually in our department. It's a very, very big department. And uh, they have their first black department head. All the department heads that have been here in their house have been Irish. Irish, you know, people and all those you know, stuff. So when I got here, I said, I'm also Irish. I also have an Irish passport. So, <laughs> so the only difference is now you have a black Irish. You know, and we've been doing some amazing things. We are in the process of setting up a, a center for global mental health. I've been in touch with Prof. Hine. I've secured $1 million to try and bring uh, people from low and middle income countries to come and train for short uh, periods of time. I'm still navigating the conflict of interest then because I wanted to start uh, from Ghana. Uh, Dean is very supportive, you know, the vice president for global health is very supportive and I'm waiting for all the various approval so that we can be able to bring some Ghanaian fellows to train here in child and adolescent psychiatry and geriatric psychiatry because I mean they do they do train in general adult psychiatry but there's there's a huge need you know for child psychiatrists and, and geriatric uh, psychiatrists uh, as well. We are also going to reactivate the intermedical student public speaking competition and create more opportunities for Ghanaian medical students to go to Dublin, uh, paid for again by St. Patrick's University Hospital. And that also speaks to the kind of reputation that you leave in institutions that you work in because I left Ireland in 2013, but they are still supporting my initiatives. I was there in September and they are also very happy to partner with me on the international fellowship uh, training. So we are hoping that people will come here for six months and then they'll go to Dublin for six months to give them a full year of subspecialty training before returning uh, to their home country. So again, you don't have to be stuck with, I want to be a public health physician. That's what I wanted to do. You know, but I found myself in psychiatry. I made the very best use of it and uh, obviously found my way back into public health where I'm the chief of psychiatry and uh, building uh, public health, uh, uh, public mental health systems. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Prof. I'm so glad you were able to join us and share the story. I mean, the key take home was, I mean, at the beginning to speak to you, because in Obre. You know, you go for this interview, like, so for the, some of them are dropping off. So I'll ask Professor Ohine and Tebri to be um, to the point with their uh, messages, because I think they said they had a program at two or something. So I see they've been dropping off. But anyway, I mean, the medical career is not going to be a simple process. I mean, if you are an animal, I could see you striving, striving. The funniest part was ending up in New <laughs> Newcastle up on, up online instead of, Time and then because you were on time, driving back and making it. And, and look at that, like within, what, nine years of moving from Ireland, you seem to be hitting the roof with the things you're doing. And then divine connection, the person who met you and just said, I'm going to sponsor you for a P out of the blue. So that was powerful. I hope the students have learned something. Thank you very much. And so, Professor Sami Ohine, thank you for being here. Kindly share your story and any comments that you feel would be helpful to the 123 medical students who have joined us. And there are about 40 people on YouTube as well. 
So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Beta. Um, sorry, I really am in a very, very, very big hurry. And I, I thought I would have finished by now. So sorry. Um, I'll have to rush. Um, well, I suppose that um, apart from the students who dance a character, maybe not too many of them have met me. Um, but I've been in psychiatry ever since I left medical school. Um, because by the time I had finished my house jobs, I was certain that that is where I wanted to be. Uh, the pathway to medicine varies for everybody. And I'm glad I'm speaking after the last two speakers because like um, Dr. I think in Tosu before, uh, two before me, I, I was not too keen on biology. Um, you know, figures were also my thing. So in sixth form, I did maths, physics, and chemistry. That was also because at the time, medicine was a consideration, but I think I was veering more towards engineering. I was not sure. And uh, so I thought that if I did medicine, if I did uh, math, it gave me the option of going both ways. Um, unlike biology, which at the time, certainly in Ghana, biology, you know, didn't allow you to go into any of the engineering sciences. So, <laughs> as it turned out, the day I went for my medical school interview, in those days, they used to publish the people accepted into university in the newspapers. That's right. And um, the same day in the newspaper came the USD, KNUSD, then USD uh, Science and Technology um, admissions list. And I had been accepted to do chemical engineering, which was my first choice um, in tech. So as I was going to the interview, I saw it. And um, well, as it turned out, I was accepted into medical school. And considering the number of people who had applied and the few, relatively few numbers that were admitted, everybody thought it was, it would be crazy if you turned it down. I didn't think so. I thought that I wanted to do what would but to be honest, I think that part of the decision was because of, should I say, soft pressure from uh, friends, family who thought, are you crazy? How can you turn down medical school? So I accepted to go to medical school. In fact, my mates who went to tech told me that for the whole of the term, my desk uh, the, the, my, this thing was there. Uh, in their lab, there was a place for me because they thought I'd be coming to do engineering. Long story short, um, why psychiatry? For me, um, as I went through medical school, there were some subjects that I was particularly attracted to. In second year, I think it was physiology, maybe because of uh, the people who taught us, but I kind of loved physiology came naturally to me. And then when I was in third year, maybe pathology, the gross anatomy part of it. And I particularly liked both pediatrics and obstetrics gynecology. So when I got to uh, final year and I was thinking, what am I gonna do? I thought, well, one thing I knew about myself was in a sense, I'm a, kind of, I'm a cerebral person. I think a lot, maybe too much. And um, I like to work out things from a mental uh, you know, focus. Even when you have to do something immediately, I tend to spend a lot more time thinking about it first. And when I was young, reading detective stories and such, what really, really fascinated me was the idea of solving a crime 
by considering the person's behavior. For example, the detective thinks about an individual, a suspect, he knows that this person um, smokes. So if the person committed a murder and had to wait for maybe an hour for the right time, somewhere close, and uh, the person smokes, he probably would be smoking in his car and uh, drop the, if he waited for two hours, he probably go through a few cigarettes and drop the tubs there. So I read a story like that where the problem was solved by looking around the neighborhood of the murder for where there were tubs of cigarettes and then going ahead to maybe pick some of them and look for DNA evidence of fingerprints, things like that. Um, so I thought that psychiatry gave me an avenue to, you know, go into people's minds, so to speak. I didn't know very much about it then. As it turned out, when we did psychiatry, at the time we did very short rotation and we had a test. And um, well, in the class, um, let's say that I, I, I did very well. And um, there were four of us who were offered uh, an elective position. There was a famous professor in Charing Cross Hospital in London who was in contact with Professor Foster, then the founding head of our department. And we were, he said we could go on electives. So others got elective positions. In fact, we also got other elective positions, but the psychiatry one facilitated me. So the four of us went to Charing Cross uh, for a six week elective and it was fascinating. For the first time, I realized that there were so many things that could be done with people with mental problems. Uh, besides, at the time, I thought they just talked to them. Medications and even electrical uh, therapies. So when I finished medical school, there was also um, somebody I knew who was, he was actually a professor and dean of law in Legon, who was friends with a professor of psychiatry in Benin City in Nigeria. So he said, look, Sami, if you, you said you were interested in psychiatry, let me send you to my friend. And that's how I began my journey into psychiatry. He was a very charismatic and, um, you know, um, colorful person. And uh, in fact, for the first year, he insisted that I lived in his house. He had a huge house, gave me a portion of it. And um, I lived and worked in the same department with him and started a residential program. Uh, did the West African College of Physicians. Uh, and when I finished, at the time I was, like many other people also thinking that I'd go to America. So in fact, I did the exams and I had, I was just waiting. But when I got to the stage where I was about to finish my uh, fellowship, I said, if I was gonna to go to America, I'm going to start all over again. It still was something I was considering. But then a few things happened, some of them relating to family. Um, so I had to come back to Ghana. Shortly after that, I had a chance to go and do a fellowship in uh, substance abuse in America, in Cleveland, Ohio. So I spent quite some time there. And um, after that, came back to the medical school where I had secured an appointment in the beginning. Um, I won't bore you with the details of that, but somehow I found myself there and have remained there since recently. Officially, I'm retired, but I continue doing the same things I was doing before. I find psychiatry 
extremely fascinating. But having said that, I think you should only go into psychiatry or for that matter, any other field in medicine, if you are truly, truly interested. Money is a consideration, as many of you have said, but it shouldn't be the primary consideration. I think I'll end here and um, thank you for listening. Bertha, over to you. Yeah, oh, Prof, thank you so much. I know you're in a hurry and I really appreciate those very short notice, but I knew even if you come and spoke for a minute, it would, it would touch somebody's life because you've been a blessing to so many lives. In fact, you've impacted my life. I don't even have to revise psychiatry. I know everything. Like I can define every term in, in psychiatry based on what I learned 25 years ago. It just comes naturally because you were such a good, um, a good teacher. So um, thank you very much for all the lives you've touched. And if anything, if there's something the medical students should pick from it, it's opportunity, opportunity. You know, someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to send you here. And then, excuse me, you just took the opportunities. And there was one thing you said that really um, was very impactful. You said you're somebody who looks at clues, the smoking, you love detective stories. So psychiatry is probably doesn't even feel like work. You're just doing the natural professor, you know, Sami or Hine. You are connecting the dots all the time and making diagnosis. And I want to plead with you and uh, Dr. Antoso that the fact that you are retired does not mean that you just withdraw from all that you're doing. Because I think that when people retire, they're like the best, the peak of all their knowledge. So um, Professor Ifa Hesse will tell you they need faculty at um, Accra College of Medicine, Professor Stephen Tabri will be speaking next. They need faculty. Our students need you. So please, I know you've been working hard, but um, we will still ask you to, even if it's one lecture a month. We will, we will. We'll, we'll, I've, I've been doing it for two, for the last two years. And I, I, okay. I, I promise All I'll right. continue. Thank okay, you thank you so much. Okay, well, right. thank you. So, so I'll beg um, to take leave now. What did you say? I said I'll beg to take leave now because okay, I need to Okay, okay, thank, right. thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, all right. So next up we have, in fact, we're supposed to end 20 minutes ago, but we're here. Um, we'll ask Professor Stephen Tabry to make comments and we'll take questions. But I want to assure the students that this was just a primer. In fact, we almost canceled it based on, they said they were not available. But at that time I had sent a message out to UHAS and UDS and I'm like, you know what, let's just do it. Whoever shows up shows up and since it's on youtube they can always go back and watch it but there's going to be a main event in january with the medical and dental council the ghana college of physicians and surgeons so um keep your ears posted for that one so professor tebri thank you for joining us um you can also share your story and any comments and then we'll ask the students for questions and then we will round up Um, yes, prof. thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Stephen Tabri. Uh, well, uh, my story is very long, but I'm going to summarize it. I wasn't going to be a doctor. I mean, my father was a cocoa farmer. Uh, we used to go to farm and he knows I could do a lot with my hands. I mean, waving bas uh, basket. Uh, I don't know in P. There is a trap we used to catch fish. It's called swab. I used to do them. Then all of a sudden, I got a head teacher who traveled from Upper East, came to my primary school, came to my primary school uh, in Odumasi, Sunyana, in the Brown Apple region. When he came to my primary school, we were last in everything. May his soul rest in peace. He said, Mr. Tibri Bizna from Bungo. He came there, I was the youngest in my class, and said, look, you have to go to secondary school. I said, what, what is that? So he motivated me, put me on the track. I said, hey, where am I gonna get money to go to secondary school? Went to my mother and told my mother, 
script that they've got juju. So he put a finger on the ground, put it on the tongue, show it to Sky, and say, look, you have to take this your boy to second. And that was the turn around. All sort of jobs because I wanted to save money. Uh, I did a lot of business with crazy, crazy while well, I've done that. Uh, I was doing farming, growing maize. My mother would take care of that. So my head teacher was the one who bought the common entrance form for me. And then I sat for the common entrance and I passed. So he left how to go to school. So my mother has to sell some of the clothes and then send me to school. But when I was selecting school, uh, my, my mentor, who was then uh, uh, for regional tribunal chairman, Mr. Otuiso, said, no, you don't have to go to school in uh, Brunhafu, in Ashanti region. You have to go to central region. So I listened to him. I filled a form. I think I took St. Augustine's. Uh, but then when the common trans results came, I went to St. Augustine's and then my name was not on the list, even though I had a mark that marks that could take me there. So my name wasn't on the list. Then the headmaster told me that, assistant headmaster academic told me that, it seems your form has been taken to Swadru Secondary School. So I have to take a uh, uh, TIPA track from Cape Coast to Swadru. Then I went there, my name was there. I said, hey, I did not choose Swadru Secondary School, so how do I come here? Uh, I think that was the time things were very difficult in Ghana, but I decided to stay. So I stayed Form 1 with the intention that when I'm going to Form, form 2, I'm going to change to a different secondary school because that was not my choice. But then look and behold, I got two scholarships. That is a CMB scholarship and then Ghana government scholarship. I tried to find out whether I can transfer to another school. They said it was not possible. So uh, I have to stay in Swedru. So from Sunyane, no car, no bus. We have to take the track that takes maize to Accra, then from Accra, you join the car and go to Swedro. I did that for almost five years. Then I completed Form 5. But then Form 5, I said, no, struggle to come to Central Region, it's not easy. So let me look for a school in Kumase. So I chose Prempe College. So I went to this form in Prempe College. But I can say that Prempe College is a good school. That is a school type that turns my life around. Because at the time in my hometown, everybody was traveling to Europe to go and hustle, hustle. But then in Prempe College, I realized that people have their parents living in UK. At that time, uh, we've got a lot of UK citizens, but Ghanaians coming to Prempe College for C4. Then I said to myself, ah, then if people are traveling from UK to come for C4, why is it that people want to go to Europe? Then I have friends, classmates from Prempe College, Jima Badu, Caesar. That time, Jima Badu's father was a professor in pharmacology. And then Ebenezer. So once a while, we go to KNUST campus. Then I see that there's a, a Caesar can take us in one of the DAS car and take us to town or to Intaco at a sports stadium. There were three cars standing in a flat. I said, hey. Then where I'm coming from, before you can buy a car, you need to travel to America or Europe to go and hustle before you do that. So this is where am I? I'm seeing people in Ghana living life like what they've been described to me when I was saying, I mean, people living from Europe and coming over. So I said, okay, this is what I want to do. And then in Prempe College at that time, if you do anything apart from medicine, you are a failure. Because Prempe College at that time is medicine or uh, death. So I was pushed 
of course, are, are qualified to go to medical school. Then the same mentor called me one day and said, you know what, I know you don't have financial support. So going to medical school in Ghana will be terrible to you. Then at that time we have one medical who has finished medical school in my village. I also went to uh, Kolebu to see him. He said, yes, I've also gone through hell because of the background. So uh, I think that there's application to go to Eastern Europe to go and do medicine. So I apply to Eastern Europe and then I find myself in Soviet Union, specifically in Ukraine. At that time, they were together. So I started in Soviet Union, but ended up completing in Ukraine. But whilst I was in Ukraine, I was hearing stories that, oh, you know what? Uh, if you finish Soviet Union and you go to Ghana, your colleagues will look down upon you. Then I said, you know what? Then I need to charter a course. So whilst in the UK, whilst in Ukraine, Every holidays, I'll travel to Germany. I joined Tubingen Sharingen Hospital, which was the first hospital I visited in Western Europe. Then from there, I went to a, a lot of hospitals in Germany. Then I said, well, the German language is a barrier. So why not? So I started looking for opportunities in UK. So whilst I was studying there, I was also studying the system in UK. When I come on holidays, I joined the club group where we all went to St. Uh, St. George's Hospital to practice the PRAP questions. And then also translating my uh, Russian language background in medicine into English language gradually. So at the time I finished, I had a control over the, the terminology of medicine. I mean, medica, medical terminologies in English as well. So I was versed in Russia and I was versed in uh, English language, so far as medicine is concerned. So I finished in Ukraine. Well, the people say, go to Ghana. I said, look, if I go to Ghana, I'll be the last person to get opportunity to specialize. So at the exams, I think I did very well in surgery. Uh, they gave me a scholarship to continue and do specialization in uh, Ukraine. So I started my surgical career residency in Ukraine. At the same time, I was doing MRCS. That's the MRCS. Um, uh, I started AFRCS. That's a fellowship of Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. So by the time I finished my residency, I passed part one, passed part two, and then I was going to do the fellowship. Then they gave us time limit and said, those of you who are starting, who have started with fellowship, if you don't finish within two years, your fellowship, it means you have to now start again because they were now they were not doing the fellowship from the beginning. You have to do membership, and then from membership you do AFRCS. So I was stuck. I said, okay, should I? I know I wasn't prepared within two years to give that exam because I had to make money again for my family at home. I was doing locum up and down. So what's contemplating, and I also used to attend conferences. I was one of the youngest who got uh, International Surgical Society uh, grant to travel to South Africa in 2005. So I went there, I did presentation, I think people were marveled. Then from there, I attended another conference in laparoscopy surgery in Glasgow. Uh, that is uh, Sir Alfred Kusheri, who was a pioneer of laparoscopic surgery in UK. So at the conference, after my presentation of the work we have been doing in Ukraine, uh, I saw one professor, Professor Costamagna from Italy, Rome. Uh, that's Catholica uh, University Hospital in Rome. He said, you know what? I've trained a lot of people for all African, North, Af North America, North Africa, South America, but I've not got opportunity to train someone from West Africa. And I want to implant someone there. So if you like, you take the opportunity, come to Italy. You are such a guy, I like you, I like your motivation. So come to 
uh, Italy, and I will train you, but we have to have a conversation that when I train you and you finish your training, you have to promise me that you're going to go back to Africa. This is me who was making some pound sterling. Of course, at that time, I built my house in Ghana. I said, well, why not? Why not taking the opportunity? So it means I have to pack everything and go to Italy. So I was in Italy for two years. So when I got to Rome, he said, well, Rome Hospital is too busy. You won't get too much hands-on. So I'll send you to uh, another city called Campobasso. I said, why not? He bought a train ticket for me all the way to Campobasso. And then I got to Campobasso. I think the team find me enthusiastic. They taught me everything I need. Just before I complete, I met my wife. Uh, she came to holidays from Holland. And then he came to Campobasso. And then he met this black man conversation. We realized that we come from the same village. So we started dating. Then uh, we give birth to a son, a boy and a girl. Then I came back to Holland. Of course, I was flying between Holland and England with locums, et cetera. But I always at the back of my mind saying that, well, I promised this man, what am I going to do? And again, I went on scholarship. I started scholarship from secondary school all the way to cease form. I didn't pay a penny. I continued to uh, Russia with scholarship, with Ghana stipend. Then I took a decision and said, look, I have to go back home and give something back. So I came to Ghana, uh, I think somewhere 1999, 2000. In fact, I didn't like it because when I came, I sent my document to Medicare and Dental Council. They say, you know what? We have to post you to a district hospital to go and do district hospital rotation. I said, where? They say, Techiman. Okay, I decided to go to Techiman. At that time, they were constructing the road. I was at the Holy Family Hospital. The place was too dusty. I said, no, let me pick my passport and go back. I came back to UK, flying between Holland. Then something pricked me and said, no, hang on, go back. You can survive. So I came back, completed the district rotation, submitted my document, and they say, you have to give exams. Uh, it was a bit frustrating, but uh, I said, well, I have no option because I, I burned all the bridges behind me and I said, I'm going to stay. So the, my first exams, the first question was about surgical site. I mean, uh, sparking temperature for surgery. I said everything I know. One of the examiners said, you know, this man is still in Europe. Why? Because I forgot about malaria. So I have to go it again eventually. Uh, as at now, because I was doing the English system and the Ukrainian system, I think uh, when I went for the exams, I think I was, they were marveled. So at the time, the decision was to go to one of the teaching hospitals. So they asked me, well, you know what? Uh, that time, uh, UDS students were going to KNUST and University of Ghana to complete the clinical training. So in one of the interviews, they said, well, we want you to join UDS Medical School. My end point was the Chima, how to get to Tamale. Before I got out of the interview, uh, Dr. Tinsego, who was the then CEO, the first CEO of Tamale Teaching Hospital, gave me a call and said, well, I learned you can do laparoscopy and can do endoscopy. I'm buying you a ticket, come to Tamale. I went to Tamale, he said, well, uh, we got a donation of uh, laparoscopy set and endoscopy set. So this is it, lying down in my office. They have been lying down here for five years. Go and set it up. He asked someone to lead me to go and look at where I can set it up. Well, that was the story. So I remained in Tamale, started as a part-time lecturer, but my eyes are, has been always on the ball. And then, of course, I had a good network among the International Surgical Society. So I started gradually, gradually. And I can tell you, uh, I've been able to bring about 
20 million pounds for the last five years to improve surgery, surgical outcome, conducting research, changing practice in Ghana. Not only in Ghana and then in the, but also in the low and middle income countries. So we are applying between Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, India, Mexico, and Anaco Direct. You know, we have a global surgery unit at the NIHR. And then the surgical aspect, that is a global surgery unit of NHR, I co-direct with the Professor Martin Dion at the University of Birmingham. So that is the story. Uh, I would like to add that those who want to help us, uh, UDS Medical School, yes, we never had mental health uh, department, but I think uh, two years ago, I was able to convince a young man by name Bill Kumsen, and Bill Kumsen came, and then there was a WHO project. And of course, because the story of the Northern Ghana has not been told, uh, we got a grant to do a WHO AIMS assessment. It was done 20, 10 years ago in Ghana. So we got a contract as the university in Ghana to do that project. And thank God we've been able to provide insight into the mental health care, apart from surgery that I do. Recently, we are doing collaboration with New York University. Uh, I think they have what is known as AMPAP collaboration. That's academic model, uh, academic model providing access to healthcare. And this project started in Kenya. Uh, 30 years ago, they started completely a, a new medical school, which is a Moy University Medical School and Teaching Hospital. Uh, that was by Indiana University. So Indiana University started and built the whole university. The decision to start Moy was taken in Ghana. I think when I was in Indiana last time, I met a professor, three of them that were in Ghana and took the decision because at that time it was a revolutionary days in Ghana. So they realized that the condition was not conducive. So they moved to Kenya. 30 years, they finished the mission in Kenya. They look back to Ghana and say, well, Ghana is now good. We can go to Ghana. And then they look at all the universities and said, well, we want to associate yourself with what is being done at UDS and Tamale Teaching Hospital. So we started that project. Uh, we are now building the Noguchi type of laboratory in Tamale is being manufactured in the US. And we hope that it's going to get to Ghana in the next few months. So that is the story. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Wow, I'm, I'm actually at a loss for words and I won't say much. This has been uh, such a very, very inspiring story. Um, I think I would have regretted, except I wouldn't know I would even regret if we hadn't brought you on the panel because for somebody who started in a village somewhere in Ashanti region, a cocoa no, farmer's son, Bro, yes. you did not even mostly me be kwa hifa secondary school. Any time me see me person me kwa yefu, na me turn crazy, na me yeh me business. Most of us in university, you know, from the whole picking up of the common entrance forms, and just a remarkable story. And the fact that you bridge between Russia, UK, you got all these skills, and you came back home. You are an example of a diasporan who took their skills, mm -hmm. invested, you know, Tamale used your endoscopy skills. You went through the whole meal, the examination, the six month, oh my goodness, such an amazing story. In fact, I'm going to contact a publisher to contact everybody on this platform because every story here needs to be turned into a book. And I can almost sense that Dr. Kwabna and Tusu, he'll be logging off pretty soon. I think that the next chapter is going to sound like yours because he's going to say, oh, we thought we were starting a small hospital. And then the next thing I knew, I had done this in Ghana and did this and I've changed so many lives. So I cannot thank you all enough. 
And Professor Ifo Hesse had an, an engagement. He, she literally canceled it to be with us the whole time. I want us to end in 15 minutes. I thought it would be a two hour program. It's become three hours. Just so we can hear from the students, we'll answer their questions. And so um, Prof, thank you very, very much. Um, this has no, been very no. insightful. I, I will read some of the questions. We'll answer it and we'll end exactly 15 minutes um, on the dot. Um, I've tried to answer some of the questions, but one is for Dr. Cecilia Banga. This gentleman says he's Emmanuel with University of Cape Coast School of Medical Sciences. Um, uh, let's see, the question vanished. She, he said that he's interested in OBGYN, but his issue is about gender biases against OBGYN specialists in US. He came across an article that said that um, there's a huge restriction to men who are OBGYNs, and the reason is that the female patients prefer to be attended by female obstetricians, making the men almost redundant, and some have suffered job loss. So he wants to know from Dr. Banga her thoughts hmm. on that. And I, I can almost say in Ghana, I didn't even know that when I was in training, there was no female obstetrician gynecologist. They were all men. And they're still predominantly men. I came to the US to find some female ones. So I'm not sure where um, Emmanuel is getting his information, but certainly um, Dr. Banga, please speak to us. I will admit that when I was doing my training, most of the OBGYNs that I was exposed to were all male. Um, there has been a cultural shift to where there are more females in OBGYN, statistically in the medical schools, in the, I'm sorry, in the residency programs, um, most of the people graduating, it's almost a 70 to 30% um, um, uh, female to male ratio right now. That being said, there are still a lot of patients who do still go to, they want to go to a physician who they can relate to, who feels empathetic towards them. They don't want to go to a physician who's going to talk down to them. So I think it really all has to do with the patient, the doctor patient interaction. Um, in my practice, we do happen to be more female. I do have a, a one of my partners who is 70 in his 70s, who still has a very, very loyal base of patients who still come to see him. And one of my other partners is in his 50s and has his I mean, especially when it comes to his um, annual patients, they are very, very loyal. They still stick with them. So I don't think that you should limit yourself solely based on gender. Those patients are there who will want to come and see you because you're empathetic, you're surgically skilled, you, are, uh, you have an amazing bedside manner, and you can listen to their issues and, and relate to them. Um, there are females in OBGYN who have never had children before. So using the excuse that you have to go through an experience to be able to relate to it, it's not necessarily a valid um, um, excuse um, to, to, ex, you know, to extinguish people from that particular field. So don't let that limit you is the bottom line. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Banga. And I like to say that um, I, I assume that this Emmanuel wants to come and work in the US because, you know, all these choices come when you have, you know, when you have too much, the Bible, you know, the Bible says that to, to, to a hungry man, even the bitter is sweet, but when a man is full, he will even reject honey. Um, all these, I want male, I want female. It happens in the UK and US where people have many doctors. I mean, in Ghana, you just want a doctor, whether it's a female or a male. So, um, that's, that's what I can speak to it. So, but thank you for answering his question. I think he should just go into the field without respect as to who, whether he will get enough patients. Cause as one of us said, if you're a doctor, you always have work to do. And another common theme has been reaching out to those on the platform. And I think it was um, Professor Anson who opened the door. He said he has 1500 students and only about 1% or so have his contact. So if all the panelists are okay, I would give your names and email addresses to the students' leadership so that they can share with them. And I hope it's not so much, hey, how can I come to America? Please find out your purpose in life. And like Dr. Hesse, Professor Hesse, fulfill your purpose. Don't just plan to want to live outside of Ghana because you can make a huge impact uh, back home. So I'm just going to respond. And all of you panelists, please feel free to respond to any of the questions. Um, 
Joshua Kamal said, all of these stories have been inspiring. The thing I still struggle with is financial, financial constitution because like many others, I come from a background where even before we finish med school, there's a lot of pressure to provide. And I'll allow somebody to answer, but what I'll say is I understand you. My time, medical school was free. To be honest, to this date, I say that if medical school, even if we had to pay $200 a year, I would never have gone to medical school. So my heart goes out to all of you who have to pay um, to become doctors. And I'm hoping that for those of us who live abroad, we'll be able to pull the resources to either help with scholarships or maybe one day start medicals, go back to the time when medical school was free, but then a caveat on holding you in Ghana, because there's no point what the government was doing. We train so many doctors for free and half of them end up living in the UK. So um, that's, please, anybody can speak. Uh, Dr. Intoso wants to make a comment. Um, Dr. Intoso, you're for, on mute. I think for many of us, you cannot underestimate the importance of finances and having to take care of things. As I said, I left and came to the United States primarily for that purpose, besides wanting to go to MIT. Uh, and while there, I worked and sent money home. And even when I went to medical school on a scholarship, uh, full scholarship, I would go to the bursar's office practically almost every two months. Oh, I need money. And they were wondering, you have full scholarship. You have everything. Why do you need money for? I didn't tell them, but I had to send money home <laughs> and I couldn't work during medical school. So, yes, many times, you know, we have commitments at home uh, that we have to do, but you, ne you need to learn to balance things and, yes. you know, ultimately things work. All right. Thank you, Prof. Um, two people have asked David Lavada. I'm David Lavada. You have medical school level 500. Please, I'll be glad if the panelists could comment on their research mentorship of undergraduate students apart from their final year project. So anybody can kindly. Yes, um, I think I would, like, I would like to say something like that. Uh, through the Global Surgery uh -huh. Network and Global Surgery Collaborative Activities, uh, the young doctors, including medical students, have set up what is known as Incision Ghana. So the Incision Ghana, what it does is that it's got medical students, it's got uh, uh, residents, and I think Dr. Dokas Usua at the uh, Rich Hospital is uh, the president of Incision Ghana. Uh, it's rather unfortunate. Uh, the Global Surgery Network has worked in all the hospitals uh, mentoring uh, young ones for research. But unfortunately, we've never got opportunity to work in whole teaching hospital uh, for various reasons. But I think now we've got uh, Dr. Emmanuel Nashele, uh, who is a general surgeon. I think he's now collaborating with us. So very soon, you may find us in uh, whole teaching hospital. Uh, we are starting. We are starting with the. Uh, Global Surgery Cohort Study, the largest ever cohort study on inguinal hernia in low and middle income countries. As of today, we've got about 1,000 hospitals uh, registered for this cohort study. So uh, if you can contact me, I'll give you the contact number of Dr. Dokas Usua, who is a member in surgery uh, at Rich Hospital. Uh, he's the uh, president of Incision Ghana. It was born out of the global surgery activities, but it's not for, only for surgeons. It's for all researchers. So you contact her. They will link you with a mentor, uh, depending on your interest, and then they will be able to support you. Thank you. All right. Um, please, does any of the other speakers have something to say? Um, Professor Vincent is into some research as well. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'm uh, definitely into research. Uh, 
but I'm not in Ghana and that uh, creates uh, some barrier in terms of my ability to be able to support lots of undergraduates, but certainly very happy to provide uh, some pointers and uh, advice if uh, necessary. So I think Dr. Ai is gonna share uh, details and uh, if any of you is uh, interested in research, would like to get some advice, uh, very happy to uh, provide some remote, remote advice. Okay, thank you. So the last question, set of questions, I'm gonna say them all together because we have exactly six minutes and uh, I wanna use the opportunity to thank the panelists and the over 100 students who signed up. Um, expect some more feedback um, as we do another one in January and uh, do share the link. So one of the questions says, um, is it feasible to study abroad or serve as an army doctor in the US? If so, please outline the requirements. Um, one, yeah, I also said, is there other options for medical law? That would have been a good question for Dr. Divine Banyumbala who has done law, but anybody can ans answer that. So medical law, and then Elom Kojo said, would you recommend a Ghanaian medical graduate who bears British citizenship further his medical career in the UK? And Maranatha said, I'm interested in nephrology. I would like to do some research work in the field. Um, Joshua said, a lot of these success stories are a result of connections and social relationships. Please, what guide can you give on where and how we can establish these relationships and get pointers and advice? Um, and then the, Emmanuel said, I'm interested in clinical trials, but I don't know how to navigate my way into that after medical school. So some, Dr. Tabri has spoken. I would just say one and allow everybody else to respond. The connections, you don't have to do anything. Just from all the stories, it was their day-to-day -day interaction. You have lecturers you are working with, work hard, create a good impression so that they want to recommend you. None of us did anything out of the ordinary. And you run to opportunity. If you see opportunity, open the door. Don't close opportunities or say, oh, as for me, this thing will not, don't be negative, have a positive attitude. So please, there were a bunch of questions. Um, all panelists kindly help me to break them down and we'll end in exactly four minutes. If I may, I may, uh, the young person or the young doctor who wants to, is, uh, is interested in clinical trials, uh, please write my telephone number 020-169-1005. Okay, 020-169-1005. Okay, and that's process. Of, we do a lot of clinical trials. Uh, in the low and middle income countries. I think the last one, I don't know which hospital you are working, but you heard about Falcon trial. We just completed Falcon trial, just published in the Lancet. Then we did Cheetah trial. Uh, these are acronyms, okay? The Cheetah trial is just changing gloves and instruments when you are closing the pass and it's found to be cost effective and it reduces surgical site infection in the low and middle income countries by 50%. So this has been published. The next clinical trial we're going to do is on the TIGER trial. TIGER trial is training medical officers in the district hospitals to safely perform inguinal hernia. That's why we are doing the cohort study to inform what we should go into the trial. So please contact me. Uh, we have a global uh, global surgery unit in UDS. We've got uh, units in uh, Kolebu, we've got Konfuanoche that we are collaborating with all the hospitals. As I said, we have not established grounds in O yet, but we are navigating our way to find our way to O teaching hospital. Thank you. Oh, Prof, that is so helpful. In fact, the, by, because you shared your number, I've gotten this idea to share mine too. If they can write it down, then if they contact me, I mean, first of all, I'll make sure you, their leadership gets your information, but there are over a hundred of them. So it's sewabb at hotmail.com and my number is 712-898-8716. So if you reach out to me, we'll make sure that we didn't just come and talk. We actually follow through on our promises. 
So any other, we have one minute left. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, for the person who was asking for mentorships and connections. I really hope that you got from all the stories, a lot of those connections that were made were based on being at the right place at the right time and also putting the best version of yourself forward at all times. So in those moments, other people recognize things in you that you already knew it about yourself. So making sure that you were ready when those opportunities presented themselves and recognizing those opportunities when they were there. You've got the deans of the medical schools here. No better mentorship than what you have available here. This opportunity, if any of us had been presented with these when we started our journeys, would have been worth more than anything to us. So just take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves and learn to recognize them when they present themselves. Okay. All right. So on those notes, um, unless Professor Ifwa has something to say, she's been on here for three hours. And Dr. Vincent, if you have one more thing to say, uh, please share it with them. Um, otherwise, we'll bring this to a close. I say that there's so much experience being shared. And what you said about everybody traveling a different path is so true. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't use other examples. You have your own story. You have your own path to travel. And each of them will get you where God intends for you to be. Because the Bible tells us, he has plans for each and every one of us. So don't ever be discouraged or don't give up. There's something for you that you need to do. It may not, it does not have to be outside. Right here, there'll be something for you. All the best. Upon those golden words, I have nothing else to add. That was a perfect summary. Prof, thank you very much. And all of you, thank you. I will bring this to a close. And um, it's been a wonderful experience for me. You all have a wonderful weekend.